good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Lugarton Institute on a day when uh, spring seems to have sprung and Martin Prack has come from Utrecht to talk about this mighty theme, the Dutch Golden Age. So uh, welcome also to this course on the history of capitalism, which is administered by the Lugarton Institute, uh, an international research unit whose publications and researches are devoted to the more comprehensive examination of the notion of prosperity in all its myriad features. Now here is surely one of the really big questions in the history of capitalism. Uh, I suppose that all too many nations and cultures decide to have a golden age. Uh, the English are supposed to have had one under Elizabeth I, though why anybody should have thought that uh, the court of uh, that uh, rather bad-tempered queen should have witnessed a golden age in the 1590s, I don't quite know. Uh, but it was decided retrospectively that it was a golden age. And the uh, French certainly had their golden age um, in the 17th century. The Spanish had theirs in the 16th. But as the whole world knows, the Dutch had theirs right throughout the 17th century, or were supposed to have one. Uh, fundamental to the idea of a golden age is when everything is supposed to be tipped up and all the successes of the different aspects of a society and a culture feed off each other. So, rather a Lugarthan Institute theme, since this notion of prosperity in economics, in politics, in culture, in life, and the spirit and ideas of the mind uh, form the subject matter uh, of our Institute's work. Now, Martin Prack uh, here has had uh, a uh, very fruitful, uh, happily continuing, very fruitful association with the University of Utrecht. There's hardly a single aspect of the culture uh, of the Dutch, uh, whether in its economics or its history or its politics, uh, that his pen has not uh, described uh, gracefully and analytically. And uh, the theme that he's going to be talking about here, as you can see, uh, the rise of the Dutch Republic, wonderful phrase, beloved of the 19th century English historians, because the Dutch and the English have this uh, long and uh, in some ways rather complicated association, uh, since, of course, one of their kings uh, did come, or a stadtholder did come over and, uh, and paint the throne of England, uh, thereby beginning the whole Whig tradition of English history. Uh, but that's another tale, which may be resumed by perhaps Andrew Roberts, a distinguished contemporary Whig uh, in weeks to come. Uh, and uh, a very warm welcome to Professor Martin. Um, and we are now uh, looking forward to discussing when did it rise and why did it rise? Was it migration, was it religion, Calvinism, people, institutions? Martin Pack. Thank you. Okay, thank you for having me and thank you all for coming on this lovely day to hear somebody talk about well, not a far off country, but a country that is nonetheless uh, not your own, clearly. Um, and yes, I'm going to um, talk uh, about politics, um, the economy, and just a little bit about culture. But that's where I want to start, because some of you may have gone to see the late Rembrandt exhibition in the National Gallery this autumn. Um, and um, I think it's no coincidence that a museum like the National Gallery is willing to sponsor a major exhibition about a uh, quite well-known painter from the 17th century Netherlands. Because in his own time, of course, Rembrandt is a genius. There's no doubt about that. But on top of that, he is also the representative of a huge number, hundreds of sometimes well-known, sometimes not so well-known painters who were also active in his own day and age in the Netherlands. And um, it's good to remember that in England at the time there were perhaps only a few dozen uh, artists working in the same field. And so this already gives us a sense of the fact that the cultural sector in the 17th century Netherlands was uh, a huge uh, business, I would almost say. Uh, and that, of course, was in itself uh, uh, the tip of the iceberg of a much larger economy uh, 
that was also extremely dynamic and I would like to say successful in that time. The Dutch golden age indeed. Uh, and so what I would like to talk about first of all is what did that golden age look like. Of course we can't talk about all the details but at least give you a sense of the, the history and the various aspects in the first two parts of my lecture and then I would like to um, uh, try to figure out why all of this quite remarkable um, series of events actually took place. And I have to say that, um, uh, maybe wrongly so, I was kind of expecting that a lot of people from the city would be in the audience and therefore I decided to include a lot of tables and graphs in my <laughs> talk, um, but they are intermingled with pictures, so I hope you'll be able to uh, abide with that uh, nonetheless and of course I'll do my best to explain them. Now before we move to the actual history I would like to flag up three different types of theories which might or might not, that is the topic of my talk, help us to explain these uh, events in um, the distant past. One of those theories was proposed in the 1980s by an actually London-based historian, Jonathan Israel. He since moved to Princeton in the United States. But uh, Jonathan Israel is a historian. He wrote a book about the Dutch economy. And his story was that the Golden Age was the result of the migration of merchants from Antwerp uh, who were uh, cut off from the sea and who decided as a result of that to move from Antwerp to Amsterdam, where they could continue their trade. A second theory has been proposed by uh, a German sociologist, a quite famous one, of course, Max Weber, in the beginning of the 20th century. And his argument was that capitalism more generally, not just in the Netherlands, but more generally in Europe, emerged as a result of the, the rise of Protestantism, that it was a, a religion that uh, encouraged people to uh, invest, to work hard, to uh, 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 make money, basically. A third uh, theory has been proposed by two Nobel Prize laureates of uh, recent years, Douglas North in the 1990s, uh, who proposed that uh, economic prosperity must be built on good institutions. And Eleanor Ostrom, who won the same uh, Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, um, uh, had a similar idea, but her um, uh, additional uh, idea was that those institutions were not necessarily imposed from above, but could also emerge, as it were, bottom-up, that these were institutions that um, could have strong civic roots. And as you'll notice, these themes will come back. Okay, so um, when in 1585 the Dutch rebels, this is in the midst of the Dutch revolt, closed off the river Scheldt and thus the harbor of what was then the hub of North European capitalism, Antwerp, uh, they already had a number of cards in their hands, if you will, that might help explain the emergence of the Dutch Golden Age in the 17th century. Uh, and I'll be talking about those um, um, elements that they could utilize for that purpose um, uh, in a minute. And then I'll also uh, uh, highlight a number of elements that were, as it were, added uh, after 1585. And uh, that mix I'll try to explain uh, um, uh, to an important extent, um, is the golden age, if you will. This graph, this is the first one of those graphs that I talked about, gives us a sense of what was going on. This is um, a national product per capita, so divided by population, the economy divided by the number of people. Uh, and here the orange line is the uh, reconstruction of um, uh, English um, uh, GDP or later UK GDP per capita and the black line is the Netherlands. And what you 
see happening. Uh, let's assume that the English line is representative of much of Europe. Then you can see that already long before 1585, that's about here, the Dutch economy was doing remarkably well compared to its um, uh, competitors. And in other words, in this graph, we can see that, yes, the golden age stands out, but it is at the same time part of a longer trend of economic growth that uh, the rebels um, eh, who were in charge in the Netherlands in the late 16th century could build on and uh, uh, from which uh, the golden age uh, originated in many ways. One of the other elements that they could use was a relatively high level of urbanization. And again, I'm going to throw some figures at you just to give you a sense of what Europe looked like in terms of urbanization in the late 16th, or rather the middle of the 16th century, and by the middle of the 17th century, and how uh, the Netherlands were placed in that spectrum. So in the middle of the 16th century, before the Dutch Golden Age, in England, 3.5% of the population lived in a community larger than 10,000 inhabitants. So in a middle or sized or larger town. And of course, the great majority of those people lived here in London. In Italy, the percentage was 13, so uh, quite a bit higher. But in the Netherlands, it was already 15. And in what is now Belgium, it was 22%. Now move on a century to the middle of the 17th century. England has tripled almost to 9%. Italy is staying at the same level at 14. Belgium, too, has stagnated at 21%. The Netherlands have moved up to 32%. So one in three Dutch people live in a city. And of course, that is where a lot of economic prosperity is made. Another thing that distinguishes Dutch urbanization from English is the fact that whereas in England most urbanites live in London, eh, London in the middle of the 17th century had already 400,000 inhabitants, there are only two other towns that uh, have a major population, Norwich of all places, with 20,000, and Edinburgh with 35,000. In the Netherlands, a much smaller country, there are 12 towns with 20,000 inhabitants or more. Amsterdam had, by the middle of the 17th century, about 175,000 inhabitants, so not quite London, but probably the third largest city in Europe at the time. Now, this urbanization in the 17th century was supported, as it were, by a very modern type of agriculture. You have to imagine, in 16th century Europe, most farmers are only marketing a very small part of their crops. They are consuming most of it at the farm. In the Netherlands, as you can see in this picture from the late 16th century, farms have become completely commercialized. And farmers are no longer consuming their own produce. They are bringing all of it to the market. This is not because they are so clever, but because they have no alternative. The western parts of the Netherlands have become so wet due to technological problems draining the area that they can only grow grass in that uh, part of the Netherlands. And as a result of that, farmers are um, uh, forced to convert their farms from arable to husbandry. And this is exactly what you see here. This also has another effect. The Dutch can no longer feed themselves. They have to go abroad to get their staple grains. Actually, they carry it all the way from northern Poland to Amsterdam. So what happens is that a massive fleet is built to carry all of that grain from Poland to the Netherlands. And this forces, as it were, the Dutch already in the 16th century to become the main navigators of Europe. 
So, and this, again, this is not because they want to, but because for ecological reasons, they are forced onto this course of action. But of course, it makes the Dutch economy much more commercial than your average European economy in the 16th century. And this, again, has knock-on effects. It means that the Dutch have an unusual number of ships, more ships actually in the 16th century than the fleets of France and England combined. The Netherlands has about 1 million inhabitants, uh, France has 10 million, and England has about 3 million, so much larger states, but nonetheless it's the Dutch that have the ships. And of course, they also have the shipyards, so they can build these ships more efficiently than their competitors. They have the sailors to uh, uh, man those ships. And because in the 16th and 17th century, merchantmen also service as naval ships, they can also fight naval battles quite effectively, and they do so quite a bit as well. So all of this is already available before 1585, before the Golden Age starts. None of that has anything to do, quite frankly, with migration, with institutions, well, perhaps a little bit, or with Protestantism. At this point in time, the Netherlands are almost completely a Catholic country. Okay, then something happens. Uh, in the late 16th century, in the 1590s actually, for the very first time, Dutch ships enter the Mediterranean. This is an area where they'd never been before. As it happens in the 1590s, the Mediterranean uh, is experiencing um, uh, major famines as a result of droughts which uh, ravish the crops uh, in uh, the area itself. Antwerp merchants who have arrived in Amsterdam have great contacts in the Mediterranean uh, and the Dutch, as I said, have the ships. And so the combination of the two makes it possible for them to send those ships to the Mediterranean and actually by the late 19th, uh, uh, the, the late 1590s, hundreds of Dutch ships are already plying the waves of the Mediterranean despite the fact that they have to pass underneath the Spanish coast. Another thing that happens at the same time is that, um, and this again is a, a new development, that Dutch uh, merchants and Dutch ships actually are going to sail to other non-European parts of the world. They reach in the 1590s the Indonesian archipelago, so Southeast Asia. They travel to Venezuela in, in search of salt. Um, they do not quite reach at that point North America, but they will in the early days of the 17th century, actually with the help of an Englishman, a man called Henry Hudson, who in um, the service of the Dutch East India Company is trying to discover a sea route to Asia uh, somewhere over the top of Canada. Of course, they couldn't do that, but nobody knew it at the time. And then also in the 1630s, uh, Dutch settlers um, um, grab colonies from the Portuguese in what is now Brazil. So you see in the 17th century, already in the beginning of the 17th century, a global trade network emerging. Uh, which uh, will include settlements uh, in many parts of the world, including, of course, South Africa, which starts out as a Dutch colony uh, in the middle of the 17th century. Cape Town is created as a refreshment station for ships sailing from the Netherlands to uh, the Indonesian archipelago, but also they trade in Japan, they trade in China, they are doing business on the Indian coast in uh, uh, what is now Sri Lanka and then Ceylon, uh, and so on and so forth. So these uh, uh, developments are all new and they all start around 1600. The East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, or Verenigde Oost-Indische Compagnie, is set up in 
1602, and by the middle of the 17th century, uh, the Dutch gilder with the um, um, logo of the Dutch East India Company um, uh, printed on it is the most um, uh, common currency for international trade in uh, uh, um, uh, East Asia. And um, it's good to um, remember um, that uh, by the middle of the 17th century, two-thirds of the European ships that pass the tip of Africa are coming from the Netherlands. And this is still um, uh, the same by the middle of the 18th century. So for a very long time, Dutch ships are dominating on that trade route. Uh, as I was explaining, in the, at the same time, they are setting up uh, trade uh, colonies uh, in the New World. Uh, they, these are not as successful as those in Asia, but nonetheless, it's good to remember Wall Street was originally built by the Dutch along the wall that the Dutch settlers in Manhattan uh, built to uh, defend themselves against the Native Americans. And all of this had an impact on Dutch industry as well. This is a wonderful example, I think. Um, already from a very early stage, the Dutch East India Company brought back not only spices and silk, but also Chinese porcelain, which became incredibly uh, popular on European markets. And very quickly, Chinese producers started to make special products for the Dutch East India Company, complete with the uh, logo of the company emblazoned on it. But in the middle of the uh, 17th century, uh, China um, uh, fell victim to uh, civil wars, which cut off the trade in porcelain. And as a result of that, Dutch uh, uh, companies started to produce imitation China, which they called Dutch porcelain, and which we now know as Delft blue or uh, uh, Delft ware, uh, to uh, a step in the gap and it became an extremely popular product. It became actually so popular that when production in China was resumed in the later 17th century, they started to imitate the Dutch imitation of original China ware. Global trade in the 17th century. <coughs> okay, so these the, are the basic facts, if you will, of Dutch economic prosperity in the 17th century. So now on to the explanations. Why did all of this happen? And as I explained, one of the um, um, theories, if you will, put forward to explain all of this is that it was because of immigration. People, particularly from uh, the southern Netherlands, from the southern Low Countries. So let's look at some of those um, aspects of migration. <coughs> and yes, there can be no doubt that the growth of Amsterdam must be explained through uh, migration. Because in the 17th century, no city could just um, survive with its own native population. The death rate in 17th century towns was such that uh, um, the population would decrease, not increase, without immigration. And Amsterdam was a town that was definitely increasing in size. Uh, medieval Amsterdam was this brown and gray, green area over here. Well, actually only the brown area. The green was added in the 1590s. But by the early 17th century, the population of the city had grown to such an extent that it was decided to add these two blue areas <coughs> over here to house all the newcomers. And uh, in the 1660s, they also created the uh, yellow areas. And one of the parts, of course, that was created as a result of that was the famous canal area, which is now on the UNESCO World Heritage List. The uh, also famous red light district over here was already in place at an earlier point. The canal zone was deliberately created 
to attract wealthy immigrants, to create an area where people who had money to spend would be able to um, uh, build um, uh, uh, houses that matched their uh, wealth and uh, lifestyle. And at the same time, uh, uh, working class districts were created uh, on the outskirts of town. So as I said, migrants were absolutely essential to all of this, not just in Amsterdam, but <coughs> likewise in London. And you can see here that particularly in the first half of the 17th century, the number of inhabitants in Amsterdam that came from other countries than the Netherlands actually hovered around 50%. And if you don't think that's a lot, just remember in London in 2013, that's the most recent figure I could find, the number of uh, 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 non-English, so foreigners living in this city was 36. So quite substantially below the number, the percentage in Amsterdam at the time. So here, and I apologize for the Dutch um, um, captions in this slide, but this gives you a very nice idea of where these people came from. One quarter of those immigrants in the 17th century came from uh, uh, what you might call um, uh, various places. Uh, some, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, blah, 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 blah. some substantial number, but not as much as you might have expected, came from the southern Netherlands. Actually, the majority of southern Netherlands came, uh, had already arrived before 1600 when the series started that we have available here. By far the largest number were the Germans, who had constituted about half of all immigrants. And then there was also a quite a sizable chunk of Scandinavians. So these 23% assorted foreigners must have come from a whole range of other European countries, including uh, Central Europe, so that is to say Poland, the Czech Republic, and so on and so forth. Very few, if you are asking, uh, came actually from the British Isles. The number of migrants coming across was relatively small. Now, in the 17th century, of course, people were um, um, uh, interested in this migration. This is a, and I'm sorry, the small print doesn't do it uh, justice. It's a kind of a cartoon about uh, a German girl moving. She's taking leave of her parents here and she is moving to Amsterdam where she will be employed as a uh, housemaid. And actually in the 17th century, uh, domestic personnel came overwhelmingly from Germany. But there are other professions, and again, the print is too small, Hotman, tailors, bakers, over 90% of those jobs were filled by foreigners, and in most cases, uh, actually uh, Germans. And uh, we go down uh, uh, the, 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 the table, but even at the bottom, the percentages are still very substantial. Now, to what extent was this also true in, let's say, the wealthy, the merchant class? We have some data about uh, immigrant merchants from the early 17th century, and they show um, a very interesting um, uh, picture because we can see here that among the richest uh, of um, uh, Amsterdam, people owning more than 100,000 guilders in um, uh, 1631, uh, about half of them are immigrants. And when you go uh, to the bottom of the table and you see the totals, you can see that about one third of the uh, wealthy merchants in Amsterdam were foreigners. Is this a lot or is this, um, uh, is this disappointing? I would say you could argue the glass is half full or half empty, but uh, uh, the story that emerges both from the activities that these people were undertaking and from this wealth distribution is that yes, the immigrants were important, but yes, the natives were also important. It was the synergy that emerged out of that immigration. Eh? 
uh, together with what was already available in terms of wealth and initiatives that created the golden age. I'm going to skip this one. And we move on to religion. So was it Protestantism that explains the Dutch Republic? Well, perhaps. One interesting aspect of the religious history of the 17th century Netherlands is this Union of Utrecht, um, uh, a document uh, drawn up in 1579 when the Dutch rebels were in dire straits and they decided to formalize their collaboration to fight off the Spanish Habsburgs. And one of the things they wanted to organize was the religious situation in the Netherlands. And uh, they decided that, yes, a, religio a religious order would be created, and everybody knew that it would be Protestant, but at the same time, they uh, said that no one could be investigated or persecuted because of his, and one should also read, her religion. So out of the Dutch revolt came a form of Protestantism that was very different, at least in its organizational aspect, from the Church of England. The Netherlands never had a state church. And even though our head of state, the king, is Protestant, this is not formally set in law. So there is no direct connection between, let's say, the religion of the country and the religion of its head of state. Yes, the Protestants were privileged. They got all the church buildings. Uh, politicians had to be Protestants. But the Protestants also had problem. In the early 17th century, the Dutch Reformed Church, the Calvinist Church, got into a fight over its doctrine. And the result of that fight was that in 1619, at the Synod of Dort, in the presence of international observers, the Dutch church uh, split into two parts, uh, which of course didn't much to help the, uh, let's say, standing of that church mm -hmm. in the country. And here we can see for one town how that played out. Um, Haarlem, one of the uh, middle-sized um, uh, uh, towns in the Netherlands, uh, in the early 17th century, had, yes, a substantial um, reformed community, but there were also the Anabaptists and quite a number of Catholics at the time. And that is illustrated by this picture of the main church of Haarlem, completely whitewashed after the Reformation, but the painter has included an obviously Catholic statue. Probably this was made for a Catholic customer. Now, by the end of the 17th century, or rather the beginning of the 18th century, we have also data, and they show us that the number of adherents of the Reformed Church has increased quite substantially. But we can also see that there still is a very substantial Catholic community in the city of Haarlem, people who continued to profess their um, uh, religion under that Article 13 of the Union of Utrecht. And so because of the size of the Catholic community, the authorities had to come to terms with Catholicism. The Catholics were forbidden from practicing their rites in the open. <coughs> but because there were so many of them, the authorities did not want to completely outlaw them. And that was also bad for business, as people told each other all the time in the 17th century. So what they did was something that you still see a lot in the Netherlands, but now it's related to the drugs policy of the country. Officially, they are forbidden, but you have no problems finding them in the streets of Amsterdam. <laughs> and this was true with Catholicism in the 17th century. So officially, you do not see a church here. But in practice, it is in this building. And when you go inside, this is what you will see. <laughs> right. 
So every Sunday, hundreds of people would convene here to celebrate Mass. There were almost 30 of these so-called hidden churches in Amsterdam in the 17th century, and they were very neatly uh, uh, put down with their addresses and everything in an official register in the Amsterdam town hall. Similarly with the Jews. So officially they couldn't profess their religion uh, in the 17th century in Netherlands. But as a matter of fact, when the Portuguese Jewish synagogue was opened um, in uh, the second half of the 17th century, William of Orange, your uh, later king, came to pay his respects. And rightly so, because the invasion of England in 1688 was financed by Jewish bankers. Mm -hmm. There are two alternative explanations for uh, the impact of religion on the rise of Dutch capitalism. One of them might be that you could argue that the Netherlands were a tolerant country, and there are reasons to make that argument. Uh, but there are also arguments against that. And so, as I explained, the Reformed Church was a privileged church. The Catholics were discriminated. Nobody in the 17th century uh, Netherlands seriously believed in toleration as a principle. If it was practiced, and it was, then it was um, because people felt there was no alternative. And yes, one could argue that from uh, a religious point of view, the Dutch Republic was more tolerant than most other countries. There is another alternative, and that is that Protestantism didn't work its wondrous ways through the work ethic, but through what you might call human capital. Protestant countries were countries where people uh, could read and write. And what you can see in this table is that the number of books that was produced annually in Protestant countries mm -hmm. was much higher than in Catholic countries, and nowhere so more uh, uh, obviously than in the Netherlands of that time. So maybe religion had an impact, not through, as I said, the work ethic, but through um, um, uh, the capacity to read and write. Okay, and this brings me finally to the third item, which is institutions. And again, I would like to highlight a number of elements about the Dutch Republic to see if we can find the explanation for its golden age in its <coughs> institutions. Now, some of you might think about institutions in a very instrumental way. And yes, there was um, a bank, a kind of uh, Bank of England type of institution set up in the early 17th century. And yes, an exchange was created early in the 17th century. You see a picture here from later in the century. But I am thinking about a different type of institutions, uh, institutions of governance eh, that ruled the country. And one important clue can be found again in the Union of Utrecht of 1579. Because in its first article, that um, um, uh, Union of Utrecht sends out a double message. On the one hand, the rebel provinces say that they will collaborate as if they constitute only a single province. And further down the mm -hmm. line, they will say we have a common army, we will have a common tax system, etc., etc. But then they go on to say that nonetheless, each province and the individual cities, members and inhabitants thereof, shall each retain undiminished their special and particular privileges, franchises, exemptions, rights, statutes. It goes on and on and on. And when you read that first article, it's very clear. We collaborate because we have to. But oh boy, do we love our autonomy. And that's exactly how they created their state. Because in the state structure of the Dutch Republic, the central institutions were only responsible for its foreign policy. But domestic politics was dominated by the provinces, 
And within the provinces, and particularly in the province of Holland, it was the cities that were very important. In the states of Holland, actually, 18 towns could cast their vote. And Holland, mind you, was delivering 60% of all the tax uh, collected in the Dutch Republic. So Holland is the province that we should look at. The Netherlands did not have a head of state. It didn't even have a proper government. Its government consisted of a meeting of the seven provinces and the presidency of that meeting um, rotated every week. The orange stadtholders were uh, acting, pretending they were the head of state, but they knew very well that they were not. Their main role was to command the army and the navy. Technically, they had a subservient role in the uh, uh, way that the political system was operating. Actually, as I was already saying, it was Holland that called the shots. And that was because most of the uh, important economic activities were concentrated in Holland. Holland was producing by far uh, uh, the most important uh, tax revenues and also all the debts that the Dutch Republic was running up in the course of the 17th century were shouldered by the province of Holland. And within Holland, it was the towns and of course, particularly Amsterdam that were uh, very important. But within those towns, including Amsterdam, you had all kinds of groups in society, not just the elites, but other people as well, who were involved in running the community. Here we see uh, the deans of one of Amsterdam's guilds, and Amsterdam had several dozen guilds, and the number was increasing in the 17th century. These people were really important to the economic life of the city. There were even females involved in running some of the charities. And of course, the citizens were meeting regularly as members of the civic militias, the people who are also seen in Rembrandt's Night Watch, people who are here celebrating the end of the uh, Dutch Revolt, or rather the 80 Years War in the middle of the 17th century, and boy, are they pleased with their own success and their own prosperity. Now, all of this involvement of ordinary people in uh, the governance of the Dutch Republic translated itself in a high, very high per capita taxation. Nowhere in Europe and probably the world were people paying more taxes than they were uh, in the Netherlands. And of course, those uh, taxes paid for all kinds of public services. But one of the things that we have to remember in the 17th century, the government was not capable of taxing like it uh, does today. And in many ways, those taxes were voluntary contributions to the public cause. <coughs> now, in all of this, and in its uh, institutional makeup, the Netherlands were not at all unique. You, if you visited earlier lectures in the series, you will have heard about Renaissance Italy, its institutional makeup was very similar to that of the Dutch Republic. And so was Southern Germany, a place where uh, uh, pre-modern capitalism was also very successful. Uh, and incidentally, you can still see that so-called blue banana uh, in uh, this satellite picture of Europe. And it's in many ways that history is still uh, with us today. And this points to a uh, pattern that I think is worth reflecting on. In pre-modern Europe, you can see two types of societies. On the one hand, these, let's say, merchant-dominated societies that run through the middle of Europe, where markets are well integrated, but states are not, where you see those bottom-up um, uh, federal types of uh, states or very small states, city states. Uh, and then on the east, in the east and the west of that um, uh, urban um, uh, spine, uh, 
we see much larger states, usually quite uh, dominated by agrarian economies, where the level of economic integration is relatively low, but where the level of political integration is relatively high. Now, all of this brings us to uh, the question I posed in the beginning, and that is, why did the Dutch Golden Age occur? And one could well ask, why here? Um, and I think that's a question worth asking because it is not self-evident. Around 1600, it could have easily been Antwerp, well, it was during much of the 16th century, uh, or Hamburg, or London, where, of course, ultimately, uh, let's say, the capital of capitalism would end up in the 18th century. Well, what I've tri been trying to say is that a number of factors played into it. The early commer commercialization, the medieval commercialization of the western part of the Netherlands was a very important element. Uh, but it was not enough to create a golden age. They needed the immigration from the southern Netherlands. I'm not so sure if they needed Protestantism. The, the role of Protestantism, I would argue, is rather ambiguous in this whole story. You might just as well say um, the fact that the Netherlands were religiously uh, tolerant was um, uh, as important. Uh, but what I would say was the most important aspect of all of this was the trust in government, and in particular in <coughs> local government. And one of the areas where we see this is that tax revenues start to flow in at a very early point in the Dutch Revolt. The Dutch Revolt was a truly popular revolt mm -hmm. um, that helped sustain this um, uh, economic success story. And I think I would like Thank to you very much, Martin. And do some advertisements for myself. Yes. <laughs>